Hello, I'm Will. Welcome to ResearchPod. Omega-3 fatty acids are essential to human health, yet 80% of people aren't getting enough of them. The primary source of omega-3 is oil from wild-caught fish, but the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations indicates that 70% of the world's commercial stocks are overfished. These oils are also vital ingredients in farmed salmon feeds because fish, like humans, can't make their own omega-3. Given that the salmon farming industry has doubled in the past 20 years, any hope of sustainable growth is dependent on a stable omega-3 oil supply that the ocean just cannot provide. But what if innovation could close this gap? Today I'm speaking with Benita Bertner, Global General Manager for New Seed Nutritional, about their omega-3 canola oil and the potential of plant-based technologies to improve human, fish, and environmental health. And joining me from New Seed is Benita Betner. Good morning. Yes, good morning, Will. Delighted to be with you. Could you tell us a bit about yourself, your current role, and kind of the steps that led you to the position that you hold now? I actually started my career in the pharmaceutical industry, where I spent quite a bit of time. I then took a jump to the entrepreneurial side and uh, helped commercialize two healthcare technology companies. Before turning my attentions to the policy side of the world, I was quite keen to understand better how you influence the environment in which business operates. And so I spent some time facilitating conversations primarily around trade and economic policy. And then I did a stint in consulting, and that's what brought me to New Seed. It was a project that the consulting firm that I was working with took on. And having done that work, I was then invited to come inside. And I was initially brought on to develop the aquaculture business for New Seed, which was great fun. And today I'm leading the full scope of what we call New Seed Nutritional, our omega-3 business as global general manager. And from the outside coming into the company, was there anything that your initial work with them as kind of an external consultant made you think, actually, these guys are onto something, or this sounds like something I could spend a lot of my time with? Or did this make kind of a business sense as a next step? I would say both. I mean, it definitely made business sense. You could see the the need quite obviously. But the other part that really drew me to New Seed was that it was a smaller company. It wasn't a large company. And all of the people that I had worked with in that consulting project were very talented and very capable in their respective fields. And I had enjoyed working with them. And so the opportunity to continue that work was not something I wanted to pass up. New Seed Omega-3 Canola fills what I would call a gap between a limited supply of this nutrient and growing demand for the nutrient. Because it isn't a niche, it is definitely a need, which is essential. It's truly essential for human health and also fish health. What is omega-3, molecularly speaking, and what does it do in a person? What happens to a person without it? So the omega-3s that we're talking about are long-chain fatty acids that are present in every cell of the body, and they're particularly important for eye, brain, and heart health in humans. The most well-known fatty acids are DHA and EPA. Those are the ones that people probably have heard of. And these fatty acids are abundant in oily fish. And it's important to understand that these fish don't make the omega-3s. Like humans, fish have to eat the DHA and EPA in their diet to have it available in their bodies or their systems. The original source of these omega-3s are actually microalgae, and the nutrients are bioaccumulated through the food chain into fatty fish like salmon, which we then eat. I guess the other comments that I would share is that most consumers are actually aware of omega-3s and have a very positive association of them with their overall health and well-being. But having said that, fewer than 20% of people globally are consuming the daily recommended amount of omega-3 that they need to actually have the health benefit. There's a few reasons that have been speculated for this. Certainly, there's an insufficient seafood consumption in some countries like the United States, some people have dietary restrictions or allergies to fish. And then there is a pretty substantial portion of the population that just dislike fish oil supplements because of the way they taste and then some of the sensory aspects. You've probably heard of the you know fish oil burp back. And then the last comment I want to make is that we've been very much focused 
so far on the human health side, but these omega-3s are also vitally important for the health and welfare of certain farmed fish. What is the fish farming situation at the moment, the kind of the pressures on, well, firstly, the fish themselves, industrially and environmentally? There's definitely pressures on the marine food chain. So maybe, again, just a little bit of context. More than 70% of all omega-3 oils are consumed by the aquaculture industry. That probably surprises a lot of people because they're familiar with dietary supplements, but the largest volume of omega-3 actually goes into the aquaculture industry. As in the fish themselves have to eat it first. Exactly. The fish themselves have to eat it so that they have it in their system and they need it for their own health and welfare for growth. And more than 90% of this oil is collected from wild caught fish for use in that fish feed that we were talking about. If we recognize that the Food and Agriculture Association, or FAO, has reported that 70% of global fisheries are fished beyond capacity, and then compound that with the fact that aquaculture is actually a very efficient and sustainable source of a high-quality protein, and for that reason, they've doubled their production over the past 20 years, and so all of this together is adding quite a bit of pressure to the supply and to the situation. Maybe another way of thinking about it is that the growth of aquaculture is faster than the replacement rate for wild fish. And as a result, growth for some high priority segments that need the omega-3s may become limited by the supply of omega-3. You know, we've talked about the importance of it for the health of certain species, particularly salmon, which is the largest, one of the largest farmed species in the world. One comment I want to add is on the human nutrition side, and that is that dietary supplements for human nutrition are sourced from the same wild fish. And so they face the same supply constraints as aquaculture. But there's another factor that has an impact on that side of the market, which is there's greater attention and concern for potential contaminants that you find in fish, like mercury, like microplastics. Again, this is you know off and on in the news. And that further raises the need for a new source and points to a growing trend toward plant-based preferences if they're available. Yes, it does just from the numbers that you've mentioned there, sound fairly terminal that so much of the omega-3 that fish need has to come from other fish. Like That just seems like a, a doomed kind of closed loop if there's no external way of getting omega-3 in there. There is some truth to it, and the industry is very concerned about this shortage of supply. In the past, when they've been short and over a period of time, they actually reduced the amount of omega-3 that they were putting in the feed to address that supply constraint, but you know, there's research that shows reducing the omega-3 actually has a negative impact on the, on the welfare of the fish. And so there's definite need for alternatives. And it sounds like you've got just the thing in mind. <laughs> we, we think we do. <laughs> so if we have to get more omega-3 into aquaculture for the fish and into aquaculture for the fish to then make it to the humans, fish food sounds like the ideal place to put it. And that is where New Seed is doing its work with a transgenic canola. Could you tell us a bit about some of what goes into making, like without giving any secrets away, of course, but what goes into making the New Seed solution to all of those downstream problems? Downstream, but dish. I would love to. <laughs> so first, I have to recognize that the idea was started at an organization called the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, or CSIRO, in Australia. This is a world-recognized research institute, and they first identified the enzymatic pathways which allow microalgae to produce the long-chain fatty acids that we were talking about. They also believed that it was possible to replicate this pathway in higher plants and developed a cassette of genes that could achieve that goal. Their idea was pretty simple. It was to develop a scalable means of producing these scarce nutrients. They went on and selected canola as an ideal carrier for these genetics because canola has an abundance of oleic acid, which can be converted into the longer chain fatty acids. It's also a crop that's widely cultivated and agronomically well known. So needless to say, their initial trials were successful. And there was an interesting finding, which was that in addition to expressing the long chain fatty acids, which was the goal of getting these canola plants to express DHA, EPA, and they did that at greater than 10% of the oil, 
this change in the genetic pathway also doubled the ALA that's normally found in canola, reaching roughly 20% or more in the oil. And that's important because I guess the best way to say it is this transformation is an additional improvement over conventional canola in that the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is reversed. It's flipped from 2 to 1 to 1 to 4. And this reversal in, the, in that ratio in favor of omega-3 is highly important for supporting healthy inflammatory responses, again, be it in humans or in animals or fish. So New Seed partnered onto this project in 2010. We were actually selected from a field of potential partners to advance CSIRO's microalgae genetics into these higher plant species, primarily due to our exceptional canola breeding capabilities. Trying to do some quick mental math there, two to one to one to four, that's roughly 800%? Yeah, that sounds about right. And it is truly critical, as I mentioned, because as humans have started to eat more, let's say, products contain processed products containing soy or plant-based, the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio has fallen out of balance. And ideally, you'd be at a one-to-one in your diet. And the same is true of fish. The industry actually tries to aim at one-to-one or or less than one in favor of omega-3s, again, for those inflammatory responses. Well, we don't have to get into the exact nature of the politics behind the scenes, but I can imagine that anything to do with a genetic modification of something that is entering feedstocks has to go through a lot of regulatory hurdles to go through the trials, the developments, and start being rolled out on the kind of scales that it obviously needs to be introduced at to deal with a global problem on human health at a population level. So what kind of hoops have you had to jump through in that regard? It absolutely does. And look, it takes a team, and in this case, a team across multiple organizations. From a regulatory perspective, commercialization into markets requires uh, market access, and many governments regulate biotechnologies, as you said, because it's a GMO, through thorough safety reviews. I'm happy to say that we achieved that safety review in Australia in 2017. We had a significant milestone on the regulatory front in 2018 when the USDA granted their approval because that enabled us to have commercial production from the U.S. for our crop and the resulting oil. Approvals followed in Canada in 2020, and this year the U.S. FDA concluded their review of our food submission So the work is not done. We continue to progress other global regulatory applications that will be required for other markets and for ultimately having, you know, accessing the grain and oil markets more globally. We did commercialize the oil in Chile in 2020 into the Chilean aquaculture market because it is GMO friendly. They use other GMO ingredients in their feed already. And on the human consumption side, we're advancing as well. We received the FDA's acknowledgement of our oil as a new dietary ingredient in 2021. And that's, of course, in addition to the food reviews that were concluded in Australia, US, and Canada. And with all those approvals, we can get to what that actually means for the food stuff in a second. But it's worth noting that something like this, the science is hardly ever done. No science is ever really done. But if you've got something that is entering food chains and across all these different regulatory fields, that it's going to be a kind of a process of monitoring things for years to come. And have there been, you know, any significant papers showing safety or efficacy or kind of the the transfer of results from those initial CSIRO findings of 800% increases of ratios changing, how those are kind of bearing out in the clinical assessments in fish, in people, in crops, in the real world. Yeah, there have actually been quite a few studies done with our oil. As you said, the work isn't ever completely done, maybe, maybe years down the road. But doing those studies and sharing that data and information is absolutely critical for the market to, to get comfortable with a new technology or new innovations. So there have been a number of papers. Maybe I'll just call out a few of them. The first one that I would refer to was published in 2020 in Frontiers in Plant Science. It was authored by the original scientists involved in the, in the development of this technology and outlined the development of a canola crop or brassica napis containing fish oil-like levels of DHA in the seed oil. 
Our human clinical trial was published in Frontiers in Nutrition this year, and it highlighted omega-3 levels in blood were significantly improved after single and multiple doses of our oil or with our oil, which is indicating the potential for achieving the desired health benefits that people are looking for when they consume omega-3. Also important in that study, it confirmed that our oil delivered as a dietary supplement is very well tolerated and that very few people reported compliance issues. It's something that, as we mentioned earlier, prevents people from consuming more omega-3. On the aquaculture side, I might call out two papers. One is a paper published by Nofema in the British Journal of Nutrition this year. It was a study that was not conducted with our oil, but it's important because it clearly demonstrated that increasing the levels of EPA and DHA in fish diets can support growth and production, that it increases the health of the fish while also delivering a very high quality product. Those authors demonstrated a clear need for developing new sources of EPA, DHA, not derived from marine resources, again, because the limited supply and what they were advocating is a return to higher content of omega-3 in the fish feed, more to historical levels. And so with that, I would, the last paper maybe that I would highlight is pending publication. It's a study, again, by Nofema, in this case, with our oil, conducted by Bjarna Hatlin and Benter Ryder. And it's a study that was conducted as a full sea cycle trial that showed improved fillet quality in harvest size Atlantic salmon fed high omega-3 canola oil, in addition to showing equivalence on production parameters like growth, like feed conversion when compared to fish-fed fish oil diets. So it very much showed our oil as, as, a, as a viable alternative. And to put things you know, very much in the hands of listeners or perhaps more directly in their mouths, how does the the taste, the presentation, like the actual physical experience of eating the food substance that it becomes compare? That is a very fair question. And in one word, I would say exceptional. It's one that we very regularly got from the industry, particularly the salmon producers, because there are some very well-developed palates in that industry. <laughs> they wanted to make sure that using a plant-based omega-3 doesn't change you know, the final product that they're delivering to consumers. So we did conduct a sensory evaluation with an accredited panel and found that fish-fed diets containing Aquaterra, which is the brand name for our omega-3 oil, for aquaculture, has the same taste and texture as fish-fed conventional fish oil-based diets. The other part of this analysis that was important is that there have been several studies conducted with our oil that also show an improvement in fillet color, and that's a really important quality aspect of the product that particularly salmon producers, want to deliver to their, to their end market. In addition to a reduction in what's called melanosis, which are these brown spots that you sometimes see on salmon fillets and none of us want to see. And the final point that I have to make coming back to the transformation that we achieved in this canola is that fish-fed aquaterra, of course, have more total omega-3 in the fillet due to the additional ALA content that is delivered with the oil. Fish are what they eat, just like us. And so in this case, that's a bonus for consumers. To think kind of sustainably and ecologically, what could this improvement in supply for fish stock and then feeding on to humans have in terms of, you know, food scarcity, food waste, and all the, you know, food source worries that a lot of people around the world are having? You mentioned Chile as an example where it's already been rolled out and Maybe we could look at that as something of a case study for what's working and what can be learned elsewhere. Absolutely. So we've already talked about the supply constraints and in omega-3 and how that might limit the growth of what's considered a very efficient source of protein for people globally. And so having an alternative like Aquaterra available addresses that. It also, on the sustainability side, there are some very important index numbers that the industry monitors and has, let's say, some pressure, social pressure to try and reduce. The ones that I'm talking about are, for example, foraged fish dependency ratio or FFDR, and one that maybe people have heard more about, which is fish in and fish out or FIFO ratios. What they're trying to do is determine and ultimately achieve that you're not using more fish to produce one fish so that it's it's a sustainable and, a, and efficient 
you know, approach to salmon farming or farming in general. But, you know, one of the things I have to point out is that even though the industry is looking for these alternatives and has been welcoming them, new means unproven. And so there's always a lot of questions. And one of the things we did was partner with feed producers and fish farmers to conduct three commercial scale trials on live farms. And what we really wanted to do was compare fish fed diets containing Aquatero with fish fed conventional commercial diets to see if we could have an impact on these sustainability metrics. But if you don't, if the oil doesn't perform, then of course, you know, you can't achieve the wider goals. Uh, Luckily, what we did find was that they grew at the same rate as the conventional diets. And there was an additional surprising finding, which is that Aquaterra fed fish uh, showed a slight improvement in resiliency and survivability, which was a pleasant surprise. So it's it's these types of studies that really provide the confidence that Aquaterra can be a viable option to fish oils and feed formulation. Did those kind of impact analyses include wider environmental context and, you know, how much can current practice be compared? We have actually done some calculations or made some calculations. And what we've estimated is that just one to two hectares of our omega-3 canola can produce as much DHA as 10,000 one kilogram fish. So thinking about it a little differently, if we consider the omega-3 oil that we've cultivated to date, and that's been utilized by the industry, that would be equivalent to 600 million foraged fish. And I'll just repeat that for a minute because it's a big number. It's equivalent to 600 million foraged fish. So you can see the type of impact that we're already having. If we look a little further out, we also have considered the demand for fish oil that will come from salmon production. And we're focused on salmon because it is the single largest consumer in terms of volume of omega-3. If we look out to 2030 and the demand estimates that some of the experts have put forward, We've estimated that that demand could be met by New Seed's omega-3 canola using less than 5% of existing canola cropland, and that would be for replacement of all of the fish oil required for that fish feed. So uh, it's a small portion of existing cropland, and the other aspect, of course, that's important is it wouldn't require any encroachment, and there wouldn't be any encroachment on natural habitats. Not even 5% of total cropland, just 5% of canola plantations that exist globally to replace the entire feedstock for all fish. Exactly. For salmon production, all of the fish oil required for salmon production and just existing canola cropland. It's highly efficient. What is going to need to happen to get you to that goal for 2030? And then what happens after that? So it relies on an infrastructure that exists and that's well known. And so that is a benefit maybe that our innovation has over other innovations. We have to recognize that Aquaterra is definitely in its infancy. The industry has started to accept our technology and we're seeing a definite increase in demand every year. And there's a lot of interest What I will say is that we're anticipating phenomenal growth over the next five to 10 years as some of the market trends that we've been talking about gain traction and familiarity with our oil expands. Our recent FDA regulatory recognitions as grass or generally regarded as safe and as a new dietary ingredient open the market for Nutriterra, which is our brand for the human nutrition side of the business to support human health and close that omega-3 nutrition gap, hopefully, that we've been talking about. And we do have a number of food and dietary supplement projects that are in active development, so we're moving down that track as well. Perhaps one comment on some consumer research that we conducted, because we wanted to get a sense for the sentiment around an oil like ours, around the need. And what we found in a study in the U.S. with 1,200 consumers was that 64% of omega-3 users, so these are people who today are very much you know, feeling that omega-3 is an important part of their health program, but 64% of these users prefer a plant-based oil when provided an option. So there's ample opportunity for us to fulfill an unmet need in that market as well. That leads very neatly onto my next question of looking not just forwards in time, but forwards across different industries. What else can be done with this kind of technology, if there's anything that New Seed is working on specifically? You mentioned some of the human stuff there, but can you forecast or speculate a little bit of where this could be transferred out to? 
there's definitely wider opportunities. The team is at the moment very much focused on these markets and these customers serving these customers that we've been talking about because we're so much in our early days of commercialization. But there are additional applications both for this omega-3 technology and other possibly plant-based nutrition products that are available to us. And there is some work ongoing. But having said that, that work is in very early stages of development. So it's hard for me to speculate yet on when they'll be ready for market. In a world where New Seed wasn't doing the work that it's doing and that it was just the bad old ways of taking tons and tons of fish to feed tons and tons of fish to get the fish bits that they need in the fish that we eat, if nothing else were to change, if we were just stuck without this technology, how bad could things be? Is it really that kind of doomed spiral that I imagined earlier? Without Aquaterra omega-3 oil in a world where it is not available. There are important segments of the aquaculture industry that will be hindered in their growth potential. There's simply not enough fish to meet the omega-3 demands for the industry. And that would be unfortunate because, as I've also pointed out, this is a highly efficient and valuable source of protein for consumers. If we think about the human nutrition side, addressing these same supply constraints will be important for increasing access to human nutrition. Again, we've touched on some of the points that are maybe inhibiting the use of more omega-3 by consumers. And so I like to think that Nutriterra will help reach new omega-3 consumers by offering a plant-based alternative that meets the desire for a milder taste profile and at the same time has a smaller environmental impact. And with everything that we've covered and, you know, all of the many impacts that this could and hopefully will have, because, I mean, I enjoy a bit of salmon every now and again, and the idea that there will be salmon in the future for my kids to have sounds like a nice world to be in. What's the take-home message, for example, someone working in policy, someone working in agriculture, or if they're a member of the public who's listened to this and hopefully has learned something about the food that they eat, if there is any action for any of those people listening to this? I guess I would just have a call for support. I mean, anyone who's interested in ocean health, because we've talked about the fisheries and is interested in alternatives to marine resources, support our work. In addition, you know, there are a lot of people who are working to increase access to essential nutrition through more options. And so our oil definitely offers that. Maybe the last point is that, you know, we would welcome support from anyone who wants to help make seafood production more sustainable, because we can have a definite impact on that side. And if those people want to go directly to any of your resources, any links, if people want to read any of the reports or just learn more about the work that you're doing, where can they find that? Yeah, probably one of the first and most easily accessible places is on our website. So if you just go to newseed.com, if you want to go directly, you'll see links to both Aquaterra and Nutriterra, or you can go directly to aquaterraomega3.com or nutriterraomega3.com, and there's a wealth of information available. And happy to have conversations with anyone who has more interest. I have to start by acknowledging the researchers and collaborators at CSIRO and a second Australian organization who supported some of the early work, which is the Grains Research Development Corporation, or GRDC, for developing this technology alongside with NewSeed and letting us partner onto such a fascinating and exciting project. I also need to acknowledge the researchers at NOFEMA, and you know they are really a well a world-renowned research institute, very well-respected, particularly in salmon research, for conducting some of the early safety and performance tests when there was a lot of questions and skepticism, doubt about what our oil could do, along with our commercial partners for testing and validating Aquaterra in aquaculture under real-world circumstances. They took it, they put it in their feed on their live production sites, and alongside us were willing to see what we would find. In the same way, I have to acknowledge the researchers and participants in our human clinical trial who demonstrated that Nutriterra is an effective omega-3 alternative for human health. And I would be remiss, or maybe I'd like to close by saying a thank you and acknowledging the wider New Seed and New Seed nutritional teams for bringing a whole new omega-3 to market. It's been an exciting journey and looking forward to continuing. 